Hi, friends. My name is Megan E. Freeman, and I am the author of this book, Alone. Alone tells the story of Maddie, who is 12, and wakes up to discover that she has been left behind when her entire town has been evacuated. Her mom thinks she's with her dad, her dad thinks she's with her mom, and they can't communicate with one another, so they don't even realize she's been left behind. Maddie has to figure out how to survive with her dog, George, who's a wonderful Rottweiler, and together they have to overcome all sorts of challenges and obstacles in order to stay safe. The story is set in Colorado, which is where I live, and where there are lots of different challenges for them to overcome, not least of which are the different seasons that take place over the course of the year. Now, this is a survival story. It's an adventure story, and there are lots of things that happen in this book. But there's also something that makes it a little different from other books you may have read, and that is that it's a novel in verse. Some of you may know novels in verse. Others of you may not be familiar with them. So I want to explain a little bit about how they're different. Now, some of you who like survival and adventure stories may know this book by Gary Paulson, Hatchet. It's a wonderful book about Brian who has to survive alone in a forest. When Gary Paulson wrote Hatchet, he wrote in what's called prose. And you can see just by looking at the page how it looks. You, even if you didn't speak any English, you could tell that this was a novel in prose because it's written in paragraphs. He starts each sentence with a capital letter, he indents at the beginning of paragraphs, and he punctuates at the end of his sentences. And the words go all the way to the margins and they go all the way to the bottom of the page. So the words on the page are determined by the size of the paper, not by anything else. And the story is told by paragraphs that connect to each other to make a chapter, and then chapters that connect to each other to tell the entire story. That's prose. I remember prose because it starts with a P and paragraphs start with P. So prose is made up of paragraphs. And that's how we see a lot of writing in, in the world, right? We see that in newspapers. We see that on the internet. We see it in letters that we might write or, or send to each other. Novels in verse are different. Novels in verse are made up of poems. And you can tell even just by looking at the page, there's a lot more white space. There are far fewer words on the page. In some cases, there's only one word per line and the words don't go anywhere close to the margins. There are no paragraphs and the poems have titles as opposed to paragraphs and, and chapters. So it looks really, really different, but what it has in common is that they both tell a story. So where Hatchet tells the story in paragraphs and chapters, alone tells the story in poems. Now, they both have a beginning and a middle and an end, and the narrative arc goes all the way through, but the way that the words are placed on the page are really, really different. I've been a poet for a very long time, and I have a really good time writing poetry, and so I wrote alone in verse. Now, what I'd like to do is read to you a section from this book, this is the part where Maddie first wakes up and realizes that something has happened, that things aren't the way they should be, and that she might be in a little bit of trouble here. Panic. Speed dial. Mom, now. Voicemail. Mom, where are you? What's happened? I wasn't at dad's last night. I stayed alone at grandma's. Call me back, please, mom. I'm really worried. Speed dial dad now voicemail. Daddy, it's Maddie. Please call me right away. I don't know what's going on and I'm scared. Please call me dad. Emma, voicemail. Ashanti, voicemail. I text, 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 text everyone. Nothing. Evidence. I pedal down the street toward the center of town. I ride around clothing, photo albums, potted plants, alarm clocks, baby toys, framed pictures, laptop cases, cell phone chargers, sleeping bags. I come to the parking lot for the park and ride on the corner by the megachurch. Half-packed suitcases lie open on the sidewalks. This must be where they loaded everyone onto the transports. What did mom call it? The embarkation point? If the streets and sidewalks are any indication, it looks like people had to leave a lot of belongings behind. I coast around the street searching for signs of anyone. Hello? Anyone here? Hello? Hello? Can anyone hear me? I get off my bike and turn in circles. I scan every direction for movement of any kind. Sounds come from the bus shelter. I run, hoping someone is still there. 
place compromised devices here. At the shelter, labeled cardboard barrels overflow with cell phones. I hear a ringtone, run from one barrel to the next, dig inside to find the ringing phone. It stops. All I can hear is my own desperate panting. I sit down on the hard pavement surrounded by cell phones and abandoned luggage. I cry. A thought so terrible. I dig my own phone out of my pocket. Speed dial mom. It rings in my ear. A few seconds later, Scott Joplin's The Entertainer, mom's special ringtone for me, comes from one of the barrels. I cry out. Eyes blurring and breath shallow. I speed dial dad. A barrel rings. I dial Paul and Jennifer and Emma and Ashanti. The barrels keep ringing. All the cell phones have been left behind. Now, one of the jobs that a writer has when she or he is writing a book is to create problems for their characters. And one of the problems I wanted to create for Maddie when I was writing this book was to make it impossible for her to communicate with anybody. I mean, think about it. If she could just call her mom or call her dad or call one of her friends and say, hey, I was left behind. I didn't get evacuated with everyone else. They would just turn right around and come back and pick her up and we'd have no book or the book would be four pages long. And that doesn't sound like a very fun book. So I was trying to think of all kinds of ways to make it hard for her to overcome the obstacles and challenges of being completely alone. Now, if you were left alone and you were in Maddie's situation, I wonder what the first thing would be that you might do. I wonder if you would be as panicked as she is. I wonder if you would be kind of excited. I wonder if you would feel afraid. And I wonder what your brain would do as you were contemplating all the different options that you had being left behind, trying to figure out this problem. Here's what Maddie does. Brain churn. What now? What now? What now? Bike 20 miles out to the interstate and try to find someone? Head north to the fire station and hope emergency crews are still there? <gasps> Dial 911. I hold my breath and pray for a live person at the other end. 11 rings. You have reached a number that has been disconnected. Check the number and dial again. I call my grandparents in Texas. Abnormally heavy call volume could not be completed. Try again. Grave-faced news anchor echoes in my head. Temporary shelters in multiple jurisdictions. With all my heart, I do not want to think the next horrible thought that moves like a fast-growing cancer through my brain. The thought thinks itself anyway. What if my parents have been sent to different shelters in different places? And what if they each still think I am with the other? Without their cell phones, it could be days or even weeks before they realize I've been left behind. So the book goes on from there. Maddie has all kinds of adventures. And before I say goodbye, I'm going to read you the very first poem from the book. This is not adolescent hyperbole. This is my reality. Alone in this place where I've been surviving on my own for over three years with no one but a big, smelly Rottweiler who farts and hogs the covers. You might think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. I'm not just being dramatic like my grandma might say. I figured by the time I was a teenager, I'd be thinking about getting my driver's permit, going to dances, playing varsity soccer, and kissing. But instead, I'm thinking about where to find food and fuel and water and whether to use Mountain Dew to force flush the toilet or to drink, even though it's the color of radioactive urine and it's probably toxic when ingested over long periods of time. Better to be radioactive or dehydrated? These are the questions that plague my daily existence, at least for now, at least until my parents come back. So that is a little bit from Alone. I hope if you're intrigued that you will check it out and give it a read. And if you like it, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.